Our next presentation is titled, Genre as a Means to Creative and Intellectual Empowerment. And our speakers are John Goshert and Amy Parsons. John is a professor in the School of Communications Design and the Director of Writing at the University of Baltimore. He received a PhD in English from Purdue and taught for a decade at Utah Valley University, where he also served as a writing program administrator. His academic research writing text, Entering the Academic Conversation, was published in 2011. Most of his time is devoted to developing the university writing curriculum in Baltimore, uh, but he is also engaged in new research, including projects on pedagogies of Web 2.0 social networks, composition and the critical tradition, teaching academic literacy in open enrollment universities, and the political aesthetics of LGBT literature and culture. Amy Parsons is a professor of English in the Humanities Department at the University of Wisconsin, Platteville. She received her PhD in English from the University of California at Irvine. Her area of specialization is 19th century American literature, and she has recently published on issues of labor and sexuality in Melville's Moby Dick. Her students in Wisconsin are primarily first generation college students, and her writing courses in particular focus on providing those students with the tools of academic literacy and engaged scholarship. This presentation will seek to address a challenge many of us have likely confronted, how to make the traits and skills we teach in our first year writing classes relevant to students. John and Amy will reflect on how to use the methods of research and argument valued by professional academic writers as a means of inviting students to critically engage with ideas and issues that are important not only to us, but to them as well. In particular, they will show how the exploratory essay fits into an assignment sequence that incrementally draws students into the public conversational exchange of ideas with their peers in the classroom and in the larger academic community. John and Amy, are you ready to get started? Yes. Yeah, I hope so. Um, Jean-Pierre, did you uh, turn uh, my screen on yet? Great, thank you. And the slideshow should be just coming up now? Yes. Great. Okay. Great. So um, Amy and Jean-Pierre, thanks for hosting us, and thanks for everyone in the audience for joining us today. Um, so like Amy Berger was just saying, we're going to talk about the research argument in particular. But Amy Parsons and I wanted to start off by taking a moment to reflect on the ways that we've, as instructors, as writing program administrators, have been encouraged to generate student engagement in our college writing courses. And Amy and I think that it's especially critical to think about how we approach course framing, especially in light of, I guess, increasingly present, increasingly ubiquitous cultural and technological distractions that really compete with the time and attention that we require and that have really historically been required for university education. I think that engagement has been connected to making our courses seem relevant to students. And increasingly our task has been how do we frame up our courses in terms of relevance to students, selling it to students, and of course to parents and community stakeholders, our state legislators, and so on, primarily in two terms. One, in terms of vocational application. That is, that students will be expected to write clearly in the workplace, be able to produce, say, a memo, an executive summary, um, genres like that, or in civic participation. That is, that our students should be able to practice citizenship through general audience public writing, like a letter to the editor, uh, a blog post, um, and so on. And we also have found that our first year writing texts have, for the most part, reinforced those framings uh, through the writing projects in these vocational and civic modes. Now, that's not, to, that's not to say that Amy and I believe that these vocational and civic modes don't have important benefits, because they do, but they also have substantial liabilities. And the primary liability is that these everyday genres don't require students to think about or practice writing in ways that are distinctive from those available to them in their everyday experiences. And they don't really encourage students to use ubiquitous technologies and devices in ways that differ from or challenge their everyday uses. So Amy and I believe instead that teaching college writing by exposing students to academic conversations about ideas can inspire civic engagement. And that teaching can prepare students for workplace writing tasks, but do so by breaking the frame of utility and applicability, and instead re rescale and reframe the scope of possible thinking and engagement that are available to our students. So what Amy and I think about and we've been talking about this for about five or six years now, is how do we reframe or rescale our courses 
to focus on the academic habits of mind in discourse conventions that are valued in the academic domain as a way to prepare students early on for success throughout their college years. And what we found is by focusing on a single transportable genre that supports critical thinking and critical engagement rather than <clears throat> discrete skills-based modes or goals, our students can be prepared for the range of academic tasks that face them in college and, kind of ironically, be even better prepared than they would have otherwise been for workplace writing requirements and civic engagement opportunities. So what we want to think about is um, how do we break the frames? How do we get beyond utility and applicability alone? And I want to turn it over to Amy, who's going to introduce our goals for research writing courses and what we're going to talk about for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Great. Thank you, John. Um, uh in this presentation, uh, we'll provide an overview of a series of linked assignments that teach first-year writers the distinctive generic conventions uh, of academic research writing as it's practiced by active scholars in the academic community, which is slightly different from the kinds of conventions that they might learn in assignments they already know how to do, like a controversial issue paper uh, or something like that. Um, the series of assignments breaks down the research process into component parts that allow students to creatively engage with issues that they care about while building new habits of mind as they move toward their final research project. Um, today we're going to focus in particular on the issue narrative, which is the penultimate assignment, and one that works to make explicit the implicit stages that academic researchers and writers go through when they, as they produce knowledge. And I'll uh, turn it back over to uh, John, who's going to talk a little bit about academic habits of mind. Right. So I'm glad that Amy just mentioned that. So one of the important um, features of what we do is making transparent the thinking and writing practices that are uh, usually quite opaque to them until they're uh, made clearer. Indeed, one of the challenges that we face as practitioners and advocates of academic discourse is that the communicative genres that most of our students bring to college writing are so profoundly limited. Um, the taking a stand on a controversy that Amy just talked about or a five-paragraph essay. So these genres are limited both in terms of the intellectual demands they make on students and the forms they take in, in actual practice. So Amy and I have turned to academic research writing genres in our teaching because they're the distinctive genre of academic inquiry and that they're increasingly distinctive relative to the communicative genres that students have brought to college with them. The academic research genres, and even those that appear to be purely technical, informational, or procedural, demand a different kind of creative engagement with a problem than what everyday genres do. And this creative engagement is a social practice, it's a conversation with a community of similarly engaged thinkers. So in order to practice the genre, students have to orient themselves as members of the community rather than isolated thinkers, speakers, and writers. So in order for students to write their own research project, they have to, in the process, acquire a critical and creative disposition toward ideas. They have to acquire what Gerald Graff called academic habits of mind that Amy already mentioned that will reframe in very fundamental, very profound ways how they think about ideas. So in this brief framework slide, we, we've been thinking about how can we help students acquire more complex ways of framing ideas to privilege argument over information to encourage problem-seeking and problematizing practices over looking for the one answer, the one conclusion, to value exploration over conclusions, that wrestling with a problem is sometimes more important and perhaps often more important than solving it, and to pursue an evolutionary approach to ideas over static ones. But especially for instructors like Amy and I, um, it's kind of institutions we work at, Many of us have faced special challenges in bringing students to these academic conversations because of the resource divide that has separated our institutions from access to current scholarship. But now instructional technologies, and especially we should think about the research data like Academic Search Premier, JSTOR, Project Muse, and so on, have made full integration of academic writing possible at each one of our institutions whether it's a first-tier research institution or a rural community college that, see, that serves uh, first-generation college students. And this is a transformative development for instructors and program administrators like me and Amy who teach at institutions that don't have substantial physical holdings 
because those databases allow us to offer students academically rigorous experiences and a repertoire of critical reading, writing, and research skills that approximate those of students in more selective universities. And what we want to think about then to go on is how <clears throat> genre awareness lines up with these academic habits of mind. And we've developed a chart to start thinking about that. And this pairing with basic academic habits of mind on the one side and academic research writing traits on the other can illustrate how this critical disposition and the expectation for creative engagement with ideas is both activated and supported by the research genre. Because it's new and unfamiliar, the academic research writing presents substantial challenges for students, but the genre as a framework also frees them from many preconceptions they bring to college writing. Most importantly, in my view, it frees students from the assumption of arbitrary and unearned authority that can so often lead, I think for, for those of us on the instructional side, to disappointing essays that can either be data dump style reports or arguments that are driven by mere opinion and not well supported, not well argued, not well reasoned. So a bit later in our presentation, Amy's actually going to talk about how this penultimate assignment, the issue narrative, integrates these two sides. But for now, I want to turn to a more, a simple, a more simple schema. And this is the one that we've adapted from the philosopher of science, Karl Popper. This is really an elegant illustration of the ways that academic habits of mind can play out in a research project, an argument, where what's valued is how a writer enters into conversation with other experts and makes a contribution that pushes the conversation's boundaries. Popper's schema is evolutionary because in contrast to, say, uh, the typical five-paragraph the, the five paper or the personal opinion essay, academic research writing opens with a question and moves then to seek out multiple testable answers which are critically evaluated in the third step. And what's important is in the fourth step, rather than concluding with a solution, what we tend to do is in, in, with our arguments is invite members of the conversation to grapple with a new problem situation and to make their contributions in turn. So to use the words of Charles Bazerman, the academic research genre affects our students, I hope, the same way it does us, as encouragement to, in Bazerman's words, find their own meanings and purposes so that they inhabit and use the genre to overcome barriers and to bring diverse perspectives and interests into the disciplines in their own turn. So for us, the genre has become a location for and an invitation to creative engagement. OK, so with that framing and this model in mind, um, I'm going to turn it back to Amy, who's going to introduce the assignment sequence we use. Thanks, John. Um, and so I'm just going to give a brief overview of the four interlocking assignments, and then I'll talk more at length about the issue narrative in just a few minutes. Uh, so the first assignment uh, that of the sequence is to have students first locate one scholarly and peer-reviewed academic source and do a summary and critical engagement paper in which for the first about two pages of the paper they have to provide a thorough and accurate summary of the of the peer-reviewed source and then do a critical engagement or response in the sort of next three or four pages um, which uh, provides students with certain skills, first absorbing and representing accurately uh, scholarly material, but also finding ways to engage in it even if they're not experts. So they do rhetorical analysis and talk about ethos and the value of sources and things like that. The next um, assignment is the research proposal and annotated bibliography in which students find three scholarly sources. They might also have two um, sort of more general use uh, sources, but they uh, have to do a smaller version of the summary in response for each annotation, and then, based on their widening knowledge, propose how they will complete their research project in a proposal. Uh, the issue narrative uh, then expands to five scholarly sources, and they, again, practice the habits that they've learned of summary and critical engagement. But in the issue narrative, which I'll talk about more at length, they sort of tell the story of their increasing knowledge. and that leads into the formal research argument, which is the final uh, paper. Um, and you'll see how these all interlock uh, briefly. But I will, um, John's going to say just a couple of things about the summary engagement and the um, annotated bibliography before I move into the uh, summary, uh, the, excuse me, the issue narrative. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, so yeah, let's turn to the summary critical engagement project in a little bit of detail. Um, 
really because for me, this micro genre or component genre is the cornerstone of intellectual practice and writing genre of academic discourse. So this becomes the foundation for the entire assignment sequence. And Amy's already described it a little bit, so let me expand uh, a bit more, and then uh, I'll probably spend a minute advocating for why I think it's so important. Um, so focusing on a piece of current scholarship, and this can either be self-selected by the student or uh, chosen by the instructor for a common uh, class experience with this first assignment, the summary engagement project gives students an authentic encounter with academic thinking and writing. So learning, the, um, learning about the emphasis on reasoned argument, uh, Amy already mentioned how sources work in an argument, a problem-seeking intellectual orientation, the use of specialized language, um, and so on. As Amy already mentioned, the writing assignment itself is divided into two tasks. First, to accurately represent the text contents in a uh, summary, and then for the student to develop his or her own arguments and positions through critical engagement with those ideas. Now, I'm especially fond of this writing project because, for one, it can accommodate every academic discipline. That is, the, all of our disciplines produce uh, article-length pieces of scholarship. And it can be adjusted to fit any number of course objectives. So regardless of the length of source, I've been successful with sources as short as six pages, um, as long as, say, 18 or 20 pages, or the length of the writing project itself. We can teach our students a lot of the same active reading strategies that we use as practicing scholars. We can start by giving students techniques for marking text rhetorically, for active note-taking, for keeping uh, summary and response reading logs that together help them move beyond some of the practices they may have brought with them to college, such as underlining or highlighting, and instead seeing reading as a way of asking questions back to the text to track its key moves and examples and assess the text's dominant and supporting components so that they're always reading to agree and support, reading to disagree and challenge, reading with and against the grain. And what I've started to think about is, seeing reading as a way of adding to the conversation. So find those places where the students can say, yes, and, here's what I think. Yes, but, have you considered other arguments? What if, or what about? So thinking about other situations or ways of applying ideas in their reading. So that active reading guides students beyond reading for content and information alone, and encourages them instead to find points in the text where they're invited to connect with intellectual and professional community. So to move on to the research proposal and annotated bibliography, which I think Amy's already done a good job of summarizing, this cornerstone practice with complex texts and ideas can lift students' self-understanding of their intelligence, their knowledge, and their abilities, because they can grapple with these lengthy texts and complex ideas as a way of preparing them to effectively forecast a project in the proposal, which helps students assemble and manage multiple sources around a central idea that, that they're designing based on the reading, and then planning for sustained engagement with and contribution to an academic conversation. So what, I'm going to turn it back to Amy now to think about how, how students' independent selection of projects starts to lead them on a journey of creative and critical self-discovery that really begins to play out in the issue narrative. So Amy, I hope I can uh, kick it back to you now. Yes, definitely. Thank you right. very much. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, the issue narrative is a transitional project uh, that helps students sort of discover the argument that they're already uh, making through the sources that they have uh, started to assemble. And the narrative works through another series of summary and engagement experiences that they've already been practicing in the previous two assignments. But the discovery narrative emphasizes their creative engagement with um, with a topic, uh, it, and it emphasizes how their knowledge has changed. It emphasizes intellect, the intellectual journey uh, that they started earlier in the semester. It's an incredibly useful assignment for helping students assemble the raw materials they'll need for the final project, and it ends with the thesis for their formal research essay. Um, so this assignment is incredibly helpful for sort of getting students from having a lot of information to being able to use that information. And what I'll do next, um, starting with the next slide, is talk about how um, the issue narrative calls on students to use academic habits of mind that translate into uh, academic writing practices. And this was a referring, we referred to this in an earlier slide, but this I'm breaking it down in a little bit more detail. So the issue narrative is inquiry-based. It seeks problems over solutions. Um, it asks students to look back over their growing knowledge 
uh, of a topic, um, and they often are pleased with the results. The project begins with questions that transform as the students read more material. And what the issue narrative does is it asks students to be explicit about the steps that they took to increase their knowledge. And it also demonstrates how their active curiosity leads to better and more interesting questions. Things that they care about actually start to drive their um, research rather than simply reporting what see, can seem like inert collections of data. And I'm, as I go through these slides, I'm going to pause to give you a concrete example of a student's issue narrative. The student's name uh, is Austin, and he wanted to do something about wolves. Um, I can give you a quick profile. Uh, he's a pretty typical student uh, at the institution where I teach. He's an engineering student. He wasn't really thrilled about taking the class. But he knew he liked wolves and um, or wanted to do something about them. And he kind of shared at the beginning of the project opinions with sort of northern Wisconsin farm communities that increased populations through reintroduction programs were dangerous. They were dangerous for people. They were dangerous for human activities. So he started um, after starting from that question, he actually then started to find other articles that were about how wolf populations can actually strengthen an ecosystem. And these were studies based in national parks like Yellowstone. Um, but this perspective gave him a new way to think about how sort of wolves impact environments. Um, and uh, he, he wanted to know more about how that impact might work in um, environments with less protection than a national park. Um, so that's kind of was his, um, his uh, initial transformation as he started to read about the topic. Um, the next slide talks about context awareness, which is another academic habit of mine. And context awareness in writing is how students acknowledge current conversations in uh, knowledge production. So by narrating the process of examining their sources, students start to see potential variety of approaches to a topic, both within a discipline but also among disciplines. And the narrative uh, the, the issue of narrative also shows students that research is rarely sort of a final definitive answer and that it comes out of engagement with ongoing ideas and strategies of problem solving. And then students can also see how conversations change and evolve over time, which encourages them to seek more recent approaches to their topics rather than just, than just finding one article or one source and feeling like they've sort of finished, um, finished the job. Um, and I can uh, go back to Austin's concrete example. One of the things that he started to see as he was studying wolf populations is that he saw different approaches and conclusions drawn by researchers in different fields. So ecologists um, have different conclusions than animal behavioralists, for example. Um, and so he started to really understand the difference between different disciplines. And similarly, he started to see that people within different disciplines might have different conclusions rather than a final answer to a single problem. Uh, this also leads to, led to, in some ways, his own self-awareness as he started to learn things, which is sort of the next academic habit of mind, because he started to position himself in a conversation as a researcher. As they, you know, narrate their growing engagement, they are joining a conversation. And um, the uh, interesting thing about the assignment that I think is really valuable is that the assignment itself creates the opportunity for students to construct their increasing authority, even if they don't feel it when they begin the paper. Um, they don't you know, often read a bunch of sources and feel like they've mastered something, but by having to tell the story of their increasing knowledge, they start to build their own authority through writing the paper. This critical engagement shows them that they have new questions to ask and new ideas to contribute. They are no longer sort of passive reporters um, on other people's knowledge, but they're starting to engage as uh, contributors to a conversation. And I'll go back to Austin uh, as a concrete example. He read a number of studies on the effect of wolf populations on other predators. Um, and other prey and the larger ecosystems in Yellowstone National Park. But he wanted to know more about how these issues might be different in places closer to human activity. So he added a new question to the conversation. Um, he wanted to understand that better. Additionally, he could see by the end of the narrative that he knew so much more than when he started, which allowed him to then direct his future research that he had left to do, as opposed to following the sources where they took him, which I think is um, how all research projects take shape. Um, 
Once he uh, started to see himself as a participant in the conversation, he started to be able to consider multiple positions, which is the next academic habit of mind. And this occurs because in writing you have academic writing, you have to analyze and synthesize sources. So by narrating their critical engagement with their research, students have to articulate connections between sources that they might not see in the early stages of gathering, um, gathering data. And by making these connections explicit in the issue narrative, students really start to anticipate the units of argument that they'll need to use in their formal research essay. So they start to see the structure of their research essay come together in the issue narrative. And they, because they bring together, bringing together sources can also reveal the limits of some sources for answering questions and therefore demonstrate new avenues of inquiry for the final project. So students can really see what Questions have yet to be answered as they move forward. To return to Austin's project, um, he read an article suggesting that wolves are bad for elk, uh, and others suggesting that elk kills, uh, conversely, help scavenger species by providing carrion. And he read other articles about competition with coyotes. And these all seemed very different to him. But when he considered all these issues together, he started to have a sense of the sections that might comprise his final project. So he was able to organize his final paper in sections, one devoted to the direct impact of wolves on other predators, another section on their direct impact on prey, another one on their indirect impact on other species. And then the final section was going to be about impact on human activities, and that needed additional research. But he started to be able to imagine all this coming together by doing the issue narrative. The next line that this all kind of links nice is making connections, right? Which making connections often positions students to make a novel contribution to the conversation that they're participating in. Because they started to make connections, uh, and see uh, limit students take control over establishing the terms of their final project. And they have to do more than just passively report agreements between sources because they're starting to see where they don't overlap perfectly. By narrating the differences between sources and the gaps in what sources cover creates this new space for students to uh, introduce a new question where there wasn't one before. Um, and again, I'll return to Austin's project. He found an article uh, that was about increased dominant and aggressive behavior among male wolves during breeding season. And at first, he didn't think this would be relevant to his environmental questions. But then he started to wonder if this aggressive behavior would increase with, po with the population, and if that aggression would increase wolves' impact on other predators like coyotes, or if it would make them more dangerous to humans. By bringing these issues together, he created a new question. When do larger populations of wolves, which might help ecosystems, start to create new problems? And that really helped him finalize his thesis for the last, uh, for his final project. Which leads to the final kind of conclusive habit of mind, which is recursivity, right? Going back through material and concluding with new problems, which is what Austin did. The issue narrative takes students through their developing ideas on a topic to reveal a set of more refined and manageable questions, particularly for the final paper. And the issue narrative helps students identify gaps or questions that they still need to investigate as they put that final project together. And these questions that they're left with often become, as it did for Austin, the basis of their thesis-driven final project, which is sort of where he ended up. Um, and I'll uh, turn it over to John to talk about how all of this then translates into what students will be doing with their final project. Great. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> so I think that everything Amy has shown with these slides and kind of breaking down those academic habits of mind with the issue narrative as a genre, um, at least in my view, uh, is a way to sort of make transparent, to go back to a word that we introduced earlier, making transparent the traits of, of research writing and critical thinking and creative engagement with ideas that are so often opaque and mysterious and overwhelming to students. But what I think the example of, that Amy brings in from Austin shows is 
that the more attention and effort students put into the preceding assignments, the component assignments, they've really assembled the raw materials for a research argument in the final project. And the more likely it is that the final project essentially writes itself. And this is something that is ironic. I had a meeting with uh, my instructors last night, and a number of them had, were talking about how this is about the point of the semester where the, you start seeing the penny drop for the students, that they're starting to recognize, I've been writing my research paper this whole time in these little bits. So that, in a sense, there's really, over the, most of the semester, there's only one paper or one project that evolves in manageable and incremental chunks, what we could call component genres, over time. So to recap Austin's steps, <coughs> excuse me, what he did was, was use the cornerstone skill of summary and critical engagement to develop, with each source, more sophisticated analysis and, more importantly, synthesis skills. skills as he accumulated and read these sources. So that a working thesis evolved from the reading rather than having to precede it, which is often the most challenging and overwhelming piece of the research project. So that Austin moved from the issue narrative to the research argument, largely as a matter of organization and development. So let me, let's talk about a couple of results, and then we'll turn it over to uh, questions and comments. The first important result that we, I think that we get out of this process is in, in encouraging and supporting student autonomy. What we've done is change the invention process and take the burden of invention from the student and place the student into an already existing conversation with and about ideas that they contribute to. And we, we can think about Kenneth Burke's famous example of the parlor conversation as a great metaphor for how that conversation works so that we can help students explore conversations, either through independent processes, because there's really no topic or discipline under the sun that they can't access now, or perhaps in a class that's developed around a common subject area that each student can explore and shape according to his or her own interests. The other important piece is not just about student autonomy, but this uh, assignment sequence is also about instructor autonomy. Because there are only four uh, major integrated assignments, there's so much room in the curriculum for instructors to shape or develop or add on to assignments in ways that they see fit. And this might mean a common topic or thematic frame for the course. It might be a way to go back to our framing ideas, opportunities to incorporate popular writing forms, workplace writing, civic engagement on the way to these formal research arguments to encourage primary source and field research, depending on the, uh, the topic or the, or the field the student wants to explore, and for meaningfully integrating activities that can make critical use of new media and online resources. So the academic research genre, and I'll sort of close on this, the academic research genre becomes a way of reframing and scaling students into their everyday practices, but does so in a way that makes them far more meaningful and gives students a sense of critical and creative autonomy when they engage with those everyday practices. So um, I don't know if, if Amy Parsons, if you have anything else that you want to say as a way of closing, but uh, this might be a good time to see if there's any questions, if we can kick it back to Amy Berger. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to open it up for questions. OK, well, Thanks. let's. Uh if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and submit them in the questions pane. I was going to ask, um, so with the, the assignment, um, the research uh, writing assignment, do you have, do you most often have the students writing like a, um, an, an essay, or do you um, incorporate any kind of um, multimodal um, text with, with that? Or? Um. I'll go ahead and answer that. My my answer will be shorter from it, perhaps, than John's. I tend to just have students do a sort of straight ahead mm -hmm. essay. I mean, they they might. I've had some students do um, incorporate some sort of direct and primary research, but for my classes, and this might be different for John, I have tended to have them do a relatively straightforward sort of research project. Mm -hmm. And John, I don't know if you do anything different from that. Sure. Um, I wouldn't say I necessarily do anything different than that, but I, I, I open up the answer to that question to be largely to the student's discretion. Um, so, Amy, you mentioned field research. 
-hmm. I often encourage students to think about what, what are the primary and most effective vehicles of argumentation in the field that you're working in. Is this this is the kind of field that would benefit from multimodal components like incorporating visual arguments into what might otherwise be a traditional research paper. Uh, is this an opportunity to start incorporating uh, representations of data, cables, slides, and so on? Or is this a way for you to contribute to uh, popular media with a YouTube presentation um, to make a PowerPoint slideshow for the class? Um, so that multimodality becomes a range of possible applications or ways of integrating what the conversation that the student can think about, the more knowledgeable he or she becomes about what works in the field and what he or she wants to do with it. Mm -hmm. And for me, then, that be, the question about multimodality becomes one more way of supporting student autonomy as they engage with these conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. I there's a couple questions here, one from Brittany Harp. She's one, um, she wants to say she's incorporated a similar project in her classes before, but found that uh, many students tired of working on the same subject all term. And she wondered if either of you had found this to be the case. And if so, how did you overcome that? Uh, well, John, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in. No, please do. Um, OK. Um, well, I have tried really hard to tell students a lot. The way that I try to deal with that is to front load telling students you have to pick something that you're interested in. And so I do a lot of work early in the semester to try to get students to really pick something that they care about. And they don't believe me at first that I really want them to pick something they care about. And then they'll pick um, a topic that they think makes sense for an English class. One of the ways that I have dealt with that is to um, allow students to read sources in the topic that they think they want to do. And if they're immediately bored, um, I sort of check in with them a lot to make sure that that's not an early response. And if it is, I give them, there's a certain kind of bumper of space for them to rethink their project. And I really don't need them to kind of solidly finalize what they're working on and tell about, I would not halfway through the semester is a little too long, but they, I would say, um, They've got some time to work it out, and so I've avoided it by front-loading, like, I really want you to be interested. Um, and so that's how I've avoided that problem, which is a real problem. I don't know if John has other strategies. Um, well, I'll, I'll start by agreeing. that I think that it's, it's, it, it can be a profound challenge. But I also agree with Amy that this kind of front-loading and topic uh, exploration is essential to making this work for me. So. Um, there's a lot of activities I think that both Amy and I do to get students to think about, I guess, three, three basic categories, which would be getting them to think about their personal <coughs> interests, <coughs> excuse me, their academic pursuits, and the professions that they plan to go into after college. And to begin just starting with lists, say, what do I know about uh, I don't know, surfing or mechanical engineering or uh, highway building, if that happens to be what they're going to do as engineers when they get out. What do I know about this already? And then using that existing knowledge base as a way of uh, generating questions. And my, my hope is that that kind of exploratory front-loading is a way to better ensure that, that students have a topic that they're interested in, but also are grappling early on with the complexity of that topic that will sustain their engagement throughout an extended research project. So I'm not sure to go back to Brittany's question. I don't think there's any way to prevent it from happening all the time, but I think there are these sort of front-loading activities that can limit the likelihood of student burnout. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, but the next question is from Jenna um, at Poly Portier. How do you go about teaching this process in a larger classroom? For example, my freshman writing courses average 30 students. Mm -hmm. So teaching researched argument, um, it becomes really difficult to respond to each student meaningfully. Mm -hmm. So she's wondering about strategies, too. Right. And Amy, if you don't mind, maybe I can, I can oh, grab please, please. that. Um, because yeah. one, it's certainly one of the challenges, not just with uh, the, the number of students in a particular course, but also um, 
from my from my position as an administrator of uh, a large program where we've got a lot of part-time instructors who are also trying to do more or less the same thing um, in a lot of different classes, one of the challenges is how to make this transportable and sort of um, generic in some ways. So one, one of the answers that I give to instructors who are worried about the same question, um, how do I do this with a large class, might be to come up to frame the class around uh, a large enough uh, common theme or common issue that can be a point of discussion during class time but can also generate enough independent interest among every student to go out and do individual projects. So um, an instructor at my, my previous institution used to design a class around uh, portable technology, portable consumer technology. So she'd start off with um, an academic article about Walkmans, um, the old Sony tape players, mm. and then use that as a common foundation uh, in a large class to then get students thinking about, well, how do I relate to portable technologies or um, the sort of emergence and ubiquity of consumer electronics. And that way the class has something in common to talk about. And maybe from, from the instructor's perspective, they're not overwhelmed by 30 individual topics, but rather have the sort of common point that frames discussions, but then also supports, again, the student autonomy. So that's the way I tend to do it. I don't know if Amy has other ideas for that. Um. And I tend to let my students, it's such a, the, the class size thing is, is so difficult. Um, I tend to let my students pick their own topics. I can get a little overwhelmed. One of the things that is, that I rely on, but that has its pitfalls is a lot of peer review. Um, but that's another thing that re requires a certain amount of front loading because peer review can sometimes not be particularly generative for students. But I really try to spend some time early in the semester on showing them what good peer review looks like so that a lot of the kind of individual attention to specific papers they provide to each other. Um, and I also do, and it's so time consuming, but, and it might, 30 students in a class might be preventative, but I also do a, a individual, very short individual conferences with students right in the middle of the semester. Um, to just to check in with them that they sort of have an idea. But these, those kinds of solutions, which I'm sure the person asking the question has thought of, um, does, do those kinds of solutions do become difficult with the larger class sizes, especially with multiple sections. Um, but I have found that peer review with some training of the students ahead of time can mitigate some of the hands-on that I end up having to do. And it turns some responsibility over to the students, which I think is also a sort of a pedagogically also a sort of good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if I may, um, I, I guess I want to add one more thing. Um, from, from my own uh, classroom practices, I think that the way, the way I might answer Jenna's question is thinking about the kind of modeling that we can do in class. So I'm actually just, I was thinking about uh, my, my class yesterday where I had one student who's working on um, uh, the ways that color and class are connected in the African American community, and which is especially important in Baltimore. And we were working on the issue narrative. And she had a question that was about her topic. And what we spent a good chunk of class time doing was sort of modeling with her topic how the issue narrative might work out. But it was, it was important for me to sort of show how you know, as we're thinking about uh, Ashley's particular topic in relation to this genre framework, also making sure that the rest of the students saw the way that that genre framework was, trans was transportable and applicable to any topic that was being worked on in the class. And we sort of, so we talked about the ways that it was both a useful framework for any topic, but also malleable to a certain extent so that students, depending on the topics, depending on how they were working their questions, out could manipulate and tweak that genre framework in ways that were meaningful for them. So I think that modeling uh, with a good student project, but also trying to emphasize the flexibility and applicability of that genre framework to any topic. Great. I think we have time for one last question. And we have a Great. question here from Sumita Roy. 
Um, she's wondering, um, how do you steer students away from emotional topics in your argument courses? Mm. <laughs> Amy, you get a lot of uh, gun control ones, right? Yes. Well, I do <laughs> authoritarian. Yeah. <laughs> I do kind of do an authoritarian just banning of certain topics. Um, but what <laughs> the usual suspects. But one of the things that actually happens because of the early emphasis in this assignment sequence on academic and peer-reviewed sources, it that is a built-in way to sort of discourage students from the kind of controversy papers that they have maybe done in the past um, and the kind of emotional topics that in certain kinds of public discourse only have one side, the people who mm -hmm. think this way are good and the people who think this way are bad. Um, if a student in my class wants to talk about gun control, um, first of all, I tell them, like, please don't. But if they really, really want to, I mean, I do have some banned topics, gun control is on the border because sort of hunting culture is really important where I teach. I insist that students begin with a scholarly and peer-reviewed academic article, which isn't going to have the kind of explosive emotional content um, because those aren't the requirements of academic writing. And so if they are completely devoted to that kind of topic, they have to find their way into it through this very different, less um, emotional mode and more specific and sort of fact-based mode. Um, and that actually does a lot of work to just pull students away from those sort of hot button emotional topics because um, the sources that I require them to find first are not the emotional sources, if, if, that, if that response makes sense. Yeah, yeah and the only thing I would yeah. add to that, I mean, I kicked it to Amy because I knew that she'd have good, good uh, <laughs> like, hunting culture examples. And the other thing I'd say yeah. to me is I tend to not have any off-limits topics at all, but rather um, and maybe in the same way that Amy described with the, the gun control kind of topic or hunting culture kind of topic is mm -hmm. make sure, again, going back to the front loading that we do in class, make sure the students understand that there are going to be certain stakes associated with wanting to talk about certain topics. So um, I guess I, I was teaching in suburban Utah for the last 10 years and making sure that when students had uh, issues of faith or belief, say, that they want to write about, that the context of the location of their exploration would be theology rather than doctrinal advocacy. And they had to you know, go into what might be a hot or controversial topic in, as Amy was describing, a sufficiently uh, academic way. So if you're prepared to get into theology, that's great, and I totally support you doing that topic. But if you, if your understanding of that topic is going to be limited by, um, say, doctrinal frameworks or something like that, then maybe it's a good. It, this isn't the right class to do that kind of exploration. So, again, um, uh, using it as an opportunity to enhance student autonomy. What kind of choice mm -hmm. am I making by pursuing this topic? What kind of uh, you know, uh, minefield might be getting in, into, and am I prepared to engage in that minefield to do the topic I want to write about? Okay, great. Well, great. Thank you guys so much. And I, I know from the comments that everyone uh, enjoyed your session, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Well, great. Thank you. And, and I think that we're going to we're going to make the PowerPoint available to everybody afterwards, right? So that there's yeah. probably a lot of information there that might be more consumable at everyone's leisure. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, I'll um, I'll shoot you guys an email, and you can you can get me the the PowerPoint slides, or you can Great. just go ahead and send them to me. We're gonna um, we will archive. We'll have a recording of this, and we'll also um, so we'll post the recording in a couple weeks. But we can make the PowerPoint available as soon as you guys uh, can send it to me. Great. Well, thanks, Amy. Wonderful. Really Thank you. The opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. It was very enjoyable. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right.